Dear subscribers, as you know, we shared many information for you, and we are studying very hard to find current news for you. However, I cannot use this channel for future. Please follow our new channel called As Daily News Report and watch our video to support us. Link in description. Also, you can reach the video we shared on Daily News Report by clicking on the top right button. We highly recommend watching, subscribing and sharing. We will continue to share some news on this channel where we take precautions against some situations for future. Thank you for supporting us. Jim. Thank you, Alex. Great to be here. Now, in your book, The Death of Money, you talk a lot about the U.S.'s status as a reserve currency mm -hmm. and the threats to that. Why does the average person care about that? What does that really mean to our economy? Well, it means a lot and it has for a very long period of time. The United States has been the dominant reserve currency since Bretton Woods in 1944 but it was used as a reserve currency even earlier in the 1920s and 1930s, and it's been very important to, uh, to the U.S. economy and U.S. citizens. Maybe a good way to start is to explain what a reserve currency is, because there's a lot of confusion about that. Uh, people hear about China uh, doing these bilateral currency deals with various trading partners. Their currency is the yuan. It was a big uh, Chinese-Brazilian deal. Chinese-Russian deals have been announced. So China's doing a lot of these around the world. But those actually don't involve reserve currency status. That's the use of it as a trade currency. A trade currency is just a way of keeping score. So I import things, I export things, I trade with you. you know, at the end, periodically, I have a deficit or you have a deficit, we settle up. That's what a trade currency is. A reserve currency is different and much more important. I think of it as your savings account. So you make a certain amount of money, you spend a certain amount of money. Hopefully, we spend less than we make and we have some savings. Well, the savings are our reserves. We have to do something with them. We can't put them under a mattress. We can put them in the bank. That's pretty conservative. Uh, we could buy stocks. It's a little riskier and so forth. So we put our savings to use. Those are our reserves. Well, countries are no different. You trade with other countries. If you export more than you import, you're going to have a trade surplus, and that is added to your reserves. Now, the question is, what do you do with your reserves? How exactly do you invest them, and what currencies do you choose? That's where the dollar comes in. Far and away, six, over 60% of all global reserves are in U.S. dollar denominated securities. Could be real estate or stocks, but it's overwhel overwhelmingly U.S. government obligations and U.S. Treasury debt in particular. Um, most, uh, most central banks and sovereign wealth funds don't get too involved in stock markets. Some do, but most of them don't. Most of them stick to U.S. Treasuries. That's an enormous advantage for the U.S. because it means our costs of financing are lower, which means our deficits are lower, our economy is stronger, Imagine if we had to finance the U.S. deficits with no foreign buyers. Uh, imagine what that would look like. Our interest rates would be a lot higher, our stock market would be lower, our housing would be lower, uh, et cetera. In addition, when you're not a reserve currency, when, that means when you are a reserve currency, other people are funding your style of living, so to speak. Just look at the Argentinians. They're not a reserve currency. Uh, if they want to borrow, no one's going to allow them to issue Argentinian peso bonds. They have to borrow in dollars. So when you're not a reserve currency, you have to borrow in whatever is the reserve currency. So imagine a world where, let's say, the euro or something else was the reserve currency, and we had to borrow in euros. Well, all of a sudden, we'd be vulnerable to exchange rate risk. Oh, you'd probably have much higher inflation. By the way, this happened once before in the late 1970s. Uh, the dollar was under so much attack and so much stress that Jimmy Carter actually borrowed in Swiss francs. The dollar was so unwanted and so... Uh, in danger of collapse in the late 1970s that the United States had to go to the marketplace and we issued Swiss franc bonds that were called Carter bonds. So, and remember, that was a period of high inflation from 1977 to 1981. Inflation in the United States in those five years was 50%, 5 uh, The value of the dollar was cut in half in just five years. So that's what, you know, when, when you're in danger of losing your reserve currency status, that's what happens. So it's very valuable to the U.S. Unfortunately, we're, we may be in danger of losing that status again. Well, what is it that threatens our status as a reserve currency? Again, I mean, are we go we're going to be back to borrowing in someone else's currency, and, and why? Well, you can't rule it out, but I'll give you some very definite reasons why. So I said, you know, over 60% of the reserves are in dollars, which they are. But in 2000, that number was over 70%. So the U.S. role as a reserve currency has dropped from 70% of global reserves 
so 60% of global reserves in the last 14 years. Imagine if that kept going and all of a sudden we're 50. 50 is kind of a tipping point. When you're below 50, you're no longer the dominant reserve currency and you might see euros and other currencies coming up. So these trends are all in play. By the way, they don't necessarily happen overnight. These things take time to play out, sometimes over years, but investors need to look forward. You know, don't just, uh, I, I call it the curse of the two second attention span. People worried about what's happening today or tomorrow. Well, that's fine if you're a day trader, but if you're an investor, you're worried about your retirement, you're worried about wealth. Uh, and your children's well-being, et cetera, you ought to be looking a little further down the road. So let me give you some concrete examples of what's happening. One of the big props under the U.S. dollar has been what's called the petrodollar deal. This is something that came out in the, in the mid-1970s, again, a time when the dollar was under attack. And the United States, through um, Henry Kissinger, said to the Saudi Arabians, look, we will guarantee your security, the continuation of the rule of the House of Saud and the national security of Saudi Arabia, because they were weak militarily and they had a, I like to say the Middle East is a bad neighborhood, they had a lot of enemies. In exchange, we want you to price oil in dollars. There's no reason why oil has to be priced in dollars. It could be priced in uh, today, euros, back then, Deutsche Marks, uh, Swiss francs, Japanese yen, gold. You can price oil a lot of different ways. But they agreed to price it in dollars in exchange for our guarantee of their continued rule on their national security. That deal worked beautifully for 30 years, through the 80s, the 90s, the early 2000s. It really did put a floor under the dollar. But just last uh, December, December 2013, the president, President Obama, reneged on the deal. He engaged in uh, the beginning of detente with Iran, uh, which is a bitter enemy of Saudi Arabia. So the U.S. is now saying to Iran, uh, hey, you are, you're our cop on the beat, you're our best friend in the Middle East. Well, this is a stab in the back to the Saudis. By the way, Saudi sells most of the world these days to China, not the United States. So how long will it be before Saudi Arabia says, okay, China, we'll take your currency in exchange for oil, uh, or maybe we'll take gold, or China buys gold and gives us gold, and we'll send you the oil. But one way, one way or another, the dollar is out of the picture. Again, that hasn't happened yet, but that process is already underway. So these, this is one of many threats to the reserve currency status of the dollar. And when that status goes away, as I described, you could be back to a world of you know, borderline hyperinflation in the U.S. So that's going to bring on inflation, probably also higher borrowing costs for the U.S.? Sure, because uh, we won't be able to borrow in dollars. Uh, if we lose our reserve currency status, I mean, the Treasury will still issue debt, but the American people are going to have to buy them. The foreign interest will be reduced. Foreigners will say, hey, U.S., you want to sell bonds, you know, price them in something else. Uh, yeah, maybe euros, but maybe uh, this world money, uh, people don't know very much about it, it has a geeky name. It's called the Special Drawing Right, or SDR. They're issued by the International Monetary Fund, the IMF. Uh, not very well known, but the uh, uh, easiest way to think about it, the Fed has a printing press, they can print dollars. The European Central Bank has a printing press, they can print euros. Well, the IMF has a printing press, they can print these SDRs. Now, they don't do it all the time. They're not doing it right now. The last time they did it was in 2009. But remember how bad things were in 2009. Uh, and that really is the point, which is they only bring out these SDRs when there's a liquidity crisis or fear of a global collapse. Prior to, prior to 2009, the last time they printed any was 1980. So you had almost a 30-year gap. Uh, but things were pretty good for those 30 years in the 80s and 90s. There wasn't a lot of stress. The next time there's stress, the next time there's a global liquidity crisis, they will bring out these SDRs because the Fed's probably at the outer limit of what they can print. You know, when they printed $4 trillion and still going, you know, people talk about the taper. Well, the taper just means they're printing more slowly, but they're still printing. They're still adding money. Uh, so what are they going to do if there's a liquidity crisis tomorrow? Print another $4 trillion? They're probably at the outer limit. The only source of liquidity left in the world are these special drawing rights. So when that comes along, that could be the new world reserve currency and again, sideline the dollar. And that will be highly inflationary. You print three or four trillion SDRs out of thin air. By the way, one SDR is worth about $1.50. You know, it changes every day. But So three trillion SDRs would be $4.5 trillion more than the Fed has printed since 2009. That will definitely be inflationary. Now, the $4 trillion we printed today, though, hasn't really caused a ton of on-the-ground on inflation. We haven't seen a, a big spike right. in the CPI or most of the traditional measures of inflation. Why is it that an increase in CDARs would be inflationary, whereas this increase in dollars hasn't yet been? Well, the thing about the increase in dollars, and, and this is you know what Paul Krugman says, he said, see, 
We printed $4 trillion. There's not much inflation in the U.S. And officially there isn't. I mean, the price indices have been, actually, we're, we're, we're staring at possible deflation. The last two prints of uh, consumer price index and producer price index were slightly negative. That's deflationary. Uh, so Krugman says, see, we can print all the money we want and inflation is not a problem. But here's what he's missing and here's what investors need to understand. The natural state of the world today is deflation. We're in a depression. This depression started in 2007. It's going to go on indefinitely. Depressions are not, or sorry, they're not cyclical. They're not amenable to liquidity solutions. They're structural. I don't see any structural changes on the horizon, so this is going to continue. So there's natural deflation that comes from a depression. The money printing has produced inflation, but the inflation was gobbled up by the deflation. In other words, it's like a tug of war. You, know, you have two par very powerful teams. Enormous forces are being exerted, but not much is happening because the teams are evenly matched. So we probably have 4 or 5% natural deflation because of the depression, 4 or 5% inflation because of the money printing. They're netting out to zero, so it does not show up in the price indices. That's correct. But imagine the deflation we would have had if they hadn't printed the money. But what that means going forward is they can never stop because the deflation is not going away. So if you're worried about deflation, which they are, and if it's not going away, which it's not, the implication is you have to keep printing the money to get the inflation to offset the deflation. So there's no way out. This, this is a Roach Motel. The Fed has literally no exit. In time, though, give it enough time, if they keep printing and keep printing and keep printing, eventually the balance sheet will get to the point where people just lose confidence. And confidence is the real wild card. Confidence can be lost very quickly, very unexpectedly. Once you lose it, you can't get it back. And that is what happened in the 70s. Uh, it's what happened to Sterling uh, in the 1930s, uh, the Panic of 1931. You know, I really recommend uh, uh, you know, viewers, uh, people who are interested, go back and read the histories of some of these earlier financial panics, 1907, 1914, 1931, uh, 1998, uh, one that I was personally involved in at long-term capital management, and of course 2008. There are good books written on all of them, but you'll see that these things keep happening and they're gonna happen again. Is there anything different in the world today, though, that would make it so that the types of things that happened in the 1930s, the types of uh, fear and liquidity crunches, won't happen today? Or are we really going to see a repeat of history, despite the fact that markets are electronic and globalized, currency flows faster, velocity can react faster? I mean, why are we doomed to repeat this? Well, the answer is both. No, we, are, we are doomed to repeat it. We will have financial panics and financial crisis. But there is one thing that's different. In the past, whenever these have happened, there's always been someone to take the baton. So in 1914, when England was under stress uh, because of World War I and their financing costs associated with World War I, remember, in the early part of World War I, the U.S. was neutral. We did get in the war in 1917, but in 1914, 1915, 1916, we were neutral. So England kind of passed the baton to the United States, and we acquired an enormous amount of gold. But back then on the gold standard, when we produced agricultural exports, cotton exports, and so forth, we could get paid in gold. So the U.S. really began its big rise as, as a gold power uh, right, right at the beginning of World War I. Now, again, throughout the 20s and 30s, sterling and the dollar sort of shared the royal reserve currency. In 1944, with Bretton Woods, the baton was passed once and for all to the United States. That was the Bretton Woods uh, modified gold standard, which lasted which last 71. Uh, then it was king dollar through the 80s and 90s. Now, uh, so there's always been someone there to pick up the, the, the broken, you know, somebody falls, but somebody else picks it up and, and continues the race. Now, the problem today is that in 1998, we had a hedge fund collapse, long-term capital management. Now, Russia was collapsing, Asia was in pain, other things were going on, but you had this hedge fund collapse that was as dangerous as what happened in 2008. Wall Street bailed out the hedge fund. That's... There's a book about that, When Genius Failed by Roger Lowenstein, but basically Wall Street bailed out the hedge fund. Flash forward 10 years, Wall Street was collapsing. It wasn't a hedge fund anymore, it was the banks themselves. The Fed came along and bailed out Wall Street. Okay, but now the Fed's got all the liabilities. Who's going to bail out the Fed? That's what's different. In other words, every crisis gets bigger than the one before. A bigger guy comes along and bails them out, but then that's the guy who gets in trouble the next time. So it's almost like a 10-year tempo. You have 1998. Uh, 2008, you know, it will be 2018, I'm not making a hard prediction about that, but I'm making the point that the next time it happens, and it will happen, uh, it's the Fed itself that's going to be in trouble because they've trashed their balance sheet, and who's bigger than the Fed? Well, there's only one answer, which is the IMF, the International Monetary Fund. 
and they can print these SDRs, these special drawing rights, but it'll be extremely inflationary. So you can see that coming, and that's what's different. So it'll save the global economy at the expense of U.S. dollar. Well, it might save the global economy. Though that, that, that might happen. They might try to do that. If it, well, they will try to do it, and uh, if, they, if it works, it will save the global economy at the expense of the U.S. dollar. So I agree with that characterization. But it might not work. People might say, wait a second, all these other currencies are going down the tubes, you know, the dollar, the euro, everything else. Uh, why is this any better? This is just replacing one kind of printed money with another kind of printed money. Now, if it works, I think it'll work because no one understands it. I mean, we're talking about it right now, but I've met PhD international economists who don't understand special drawing rights, so no reason everyday Americans should. Um, so if it works, part of it'll be the the, you know, the, the mumbo-jumbo approach that, you know, trust us, it's all fine, even though no one understands it. But that might not work. People might see through it, in which case you'll probably have to go back to a gold standard because that's the one thing people do understand. It's the one thing they do trust. So there's not a central bank in the world that wants a gold standard, but they may have to go to a gold standard to restore confidence. So let's wait and see on that. It's ultimately a game of confidence. Once the consumers lose confidence, once uh, countries and banks lose confidence in the dollar. So that, that's ultimately the tipping point, right? Correct. If I had to pick one word, one word to describe risk in capital markets, I would say confidence. You know, people like to talk about Bitcoin, you know, is Bitcoin money? Well, it's a kind of money. I, I wouldn't argue with that. But at various times in history, feathers have been money, clamshells have been money, uh, silver, gold, paper, Bitcoin, digital, crypto. They can be money if people have confidence. But the minute confidence is lost, they're not money anymore, and whatever you had in that is wiped out. So then the question is, well, why should I have confidence? That's a matter of trust. Do I trust the policymakers? Are they helping the economy, or are they trying to rip me off with inflation? Are they lying to me? Well, just look at any opinion poll. People don't have much trust in policymakers these days. So I would say that confidence is close to a tipping point. One of my concerns about policymakers, the Treasury, the Federal Reserve, the White House, and others, is that they don't understand this. What you and I are discussing right now, they take it for granted. They assume that the dollar is king and always will be king, and how could you possibly question the confidence of the dollar? Well, people are questioning it, uh, and more will do so in the future, but it is one of these tipping point things where it's not like a long, slow, gradual decline. It can happen very quickly, and that's the point. When that confidence erosion starts to happen, starts to accelerate, uh, how do people want to be positioned as investors? I mean, how can you know you, the average everyday investor position themselves to not lose their shirt when uh, the world loses its confidence in the dollar or the euro or any other major currency? Right. Well, the first piece of advice I would give is position now. Don't wait till this happens because when it happens, it a it could happen very quickly, and b you may find that the things you want to go into are not available at any price. Uh, you know, I, I do a lot of. Uh, public speaking and, and writing, as you know, on these topics. And one of the questions I'm asked most frequently is, you know, hey, Jim, when's it going to be? What's it going to be? You know, almost as if I'm supposed to call them at 3.30 in the afternoon, the day before, and they're like, oh, I'll sell all my stocks at the close and buy gold the next day. It doesn't work that way. I can see it coming, and I can describe the dynamics, and I can understand the magnitude of the risk, but I'm not going to know what day it is, because it's going to be some unexpected event that maybe none of us see coming. You, I can just tell you it, it is coming. So first of all, position yourself now. What I recommend to investors, you want about 10% gold. You know, maybe a little more if you want to lean into it, if, you're, if you have a higher risk appetite, but not much less than that. Uh, don't go all in. I mean, I have clients who have 50% gold. I, I tell them, well, you didn't get that from me. I don't recommend going all in on anything. 10% gold to me is about the right amount. Uh, and here's the point. You know, gold, first of all, gold's volatile. We all know that. Uh, and it's been going down lately. I mean, it hit a peak in 2011. I think it's going to go much, much higher from here, but it's been down since 2011. There's no denying that. Uh, but the thing is, if you have 10% in gold and it goes down 10%, you only lost 1% on your portfolio. You lost 10% of 10%, which is 1%. Chances are the other things you've got, maybe land or real estate or art or maybe uh, um, maybe you're in stocks or bonds or traditional, maybe you're in alternatives, venture, whatever else you're in, probably doing fine and you're doing fine. But if this meltdown comes that I'm describing and all these other things start crashing 20, 30, 40 percent or more, gold is likely to be the thing that's going up 200, 300, 400 percent. I would expect it to get to $7,000 an ounce or more. I, again, some analysis, 10,000 or higher, some even higher than that. That's where I think gold is going to end up. 
again, not all at once. Well, if that happens, you may be losing over here, but you're making a lot of money over here. So it's a little bit like fire insurance on your house. You don't want your house to burn down, but heaven forbid if it does, you're sure glad you have the insurance. And when you write that premium check to the insurance company every month, you don't think you're throwing your money away. You think you're doing a smart thing. So get some gold. It's volatile. Don't get too upset with the day-to-day -day price action. Don't get too much, but you know, but institutional allocations are about one and a half percent. So I'm recommending 10, so there's a long way to go there. People need to get a lot more gold. If people had followed that advice in, say, 1998, they probably wouldn't have sweated all during the NASDAQ crash or the 2008 sure. bubble popping. I mean, gold jumped to uh, what, four or five, six hundred percent in the uh, last 15 years. So you see that happening again as we head into inflation? But yes, but perhaps a lot faster. I mean, that, yeah, it has, it has gone up uh, uh, about uh, 600 percent or more since 1998. Uh, but I would see it sort of chugging along with a lot of volatility, and then I think we're getting close to the stage where it's just going to gap up, meaning you know one day it'll go up $100 an ounce, and that'll make a lot of headlines, and the next day it'll go up another $100 an ounce, and that'll make headlines, and all the talking heads on TV will go, oh, it's a bubble, don't be a fool, et cetera. But then you know the next day, boom, it keeps going. Then what happens is then people wake up and say, oh, gee, I better get some gold. What they'll find is they can't get it. You know, they'll call the dealer. Sorry, sold out. They'll go to a coin shop. Sorry, we're back ordered. They'll call the mint. Uh, we're not taking new orders. The big guys will get it. You know, the sovereign wealth funds, the central banks, the hedge funds. But everyday investors, you'll, you'll actually find that you won't be able to get it at any price. So there might be a Comex price on television, but you won't be able to transact.